is one of our sponsors. You guys can you guys can leave now. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. You guys were amazing. Excellent panel and very representative. What we love to see, uh, all of the voices. And that was a mic drop. We even had a mic drop, a real mic drop, not some sort of fake, you know, act, you know, real uh, you know, pretend accidental one, a real accidental one. So anyway, so Dan uh, Pia, Pia Kosh, Pia, uh, I'm going to mangle his last name as usual. Uh, Pia Kaj, like Kajafo, right? What? Pia Kaj. I said, I said that's what I said, right? Pia Kaj. Anyway, so Dan Pia Kaj. Uh, who's got, Chris, do you got the, people always walk off with a clicker. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, CJ, come back. Do you have the clicker? Okay, good. Excellent. Um, yeah, no. uh, okay, so uh, I'll let Dan introduce himself while I get his presentation up. Awesome. What do I do? This way? Hey, everybody. So, again, my name is Dan Piekaj. I'm the head of healthcare and life sciences at DataArt. Um, DataArt, we're a technology consulting, custom software development, design company. And usually when I explain this to people, they go, oh, you're a bunch of coders. You know, a bunch of geeks sitting in the corner just typing away. Um, and, and they assume that's what we do. Uh, so what I just decided was today I'd actually take you through a little bit of what we actually do and, and you know, some of the work we've done recently. So before I go there, I want to take you back to 1996. In 1996, AOL was pretty much the internet. You know, that's what we all used. Um, I actually saw somebody the other day who still had an AOL email address. We had 28.8 KB modems. If you were lucky, I think the 36 was just coming out, and that was blazing fast. Google didn't even exist. And unfortunately, that same year, my mother came down with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. She fought for about three years. And, you know, my father wasn't quite the caretaker, so it fell on us kids. And we were afraid. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know if she was getting the right care. And it was frustrating. And we, and we saw her pass. And now I'm dealing with it again with another person in my family. And you know what? Nothing's fucking changed. There's no, there's no end of life support tool that's gonna help us understand how to deal with this. There's nothing that, there's no patient portal that has told us, oh, this is what the doctor means when he's saying that she should get, you know, um, this form of chemo or that form of chemo, or what's gonna happen when, when hospice care comes up? How should we as the family deal with this? All the, the awesome software that everybody here is developing that we're putting into play, it's, in this case, at least, and from what I've seen, it's not actually being used to benefit the patient. We don't just work in healthcare and life sciences, we work across a couple other industries also. And when I look at this list of the industries we specialize in, it reminds me of a game that we used to do in school called, one of these is not like the other. Which one of these has not been disrupted in the last 20 years? One. Every other industry here has been totally disrupted. It's nothing like it was 20 years ago. But when I go to the doctor, it's the same as it was. When I go to the hospital, it's the same as it was. It's changing. We've got EMRs. They suck, like you said, right? The horrible usability, and we'll get to that. You know, we, we've got AI and machine learning and all these different things, but it's just not getting through to the patient as quickly as it should. Just think about it. Travel and hospitality, I don't know if anybody knows what the GDS is, but you can take two different airlines on one trip and they talk to each other, you know? Blockbuster's gone, we stream movies now. Things have changed entirely in all these other industries. 
finance, the one industry that is probably just as, as uh, you know, privacy concerned as health healthcare, I can use my ATM card anywhere in the world and get access to my account and my information. Can't do that in healthcare. It's not because of the technology. Over here, this patient portal that we'll rename nameless is the patient portal that the the healthcare organization I use uses. This is what I like to call like early 1990 design. As you can see, there's you know the AOL, you got Amazon 1996. I actually think the Amazon 1996 design was better than the patient portal that I have to use today. It, it shows you how much the people who developed this actually cared about the patient's journey. And I'm sorry if whoever developed this is sitting in this room here, just quietly sit there and, and don't say anything. And you know what? It's not just this one. Some of the best patient portals out there are the same. And it's because everybody's so concerned with the outcome or, or, or we, we need to achieve this. They forget about the journey. They forget that life is a journey and every step along the way, you have to understand what the patient's going through, what they're thinking about. Do you actually care about the patient? Are we providing health care? Are we just trying to move them through a system? When you develop a product that marries value with simplicity and beauty, people want to use it. People push to use it. But you have to understand your patient or your, your user. Is it a doctor? Is it the family? Is it a nurse? When you understand who they are and you understand what's special to them, what's important to them, you understand how you interact with them, you can start to get an idea of how to actually build a product around your user's needs. How are they going to interact with you? Is it going to be mobile? Is it going to be over a laptop, a desktop? And what's the critical path? You know, you can't boil the ocean. You can't do everything, right? So when it comes to patients, we have, or, or the doctor, there's a lot of things we have to take care of a lot of different systems that can be used. There's plenty of room for all sorts of, of solutions here. But in whatever solution or whatever, however you're trying to interact with your client, with your patient, with the doctor, what's the critical path? One good thing is I think there's actually a turning point right now. This is um, Heim from Freesia. Freesia is a uh, patient check-in system and, and it it's in like 30,000 doctor's offices or something. I was talking to him the other day and he was saying he's seeing a tide turn. He's seeing people actually start to want to implement technology more and more now. And it's got to come with good design though. Designing for the doctor, designing for the patient, designing for the family, whoever it may be. You can't just, you know, when it comes to the EHRs and everything, we put them in place because regulations paid people to. And they were built and designed to meet the regulations, not to necessarily lower cost of healthcare. It was built to actually get to a point where we could actually track cost. So we could change regulations to, to fix it later. And, and I'm not saying there's not a return on investment for some of the EHRs. It's just not what it should have been. When you actually start thinking about what you actually want to design at that point, everything that we've done so far, you could do this on sticky notes to understand exactly how you want to work with, the, with your patient, with the end user. And then finally, once you get to a point where you understand the type of product you want to create, you can create rapid prototypes without a single bit of coding and actually put it in the hands of real users. Something uh, interesting, we're actually developing a, an artificial intelligence, you know, machine learning, whatever you want to call it, um, system internally that does facial recognition and um, emotional recognition to do the, the patient test, I'm sorry, the end user testing for, for systems so that you can actually watch a person as they're using your product and see when they grimace, understand when they don't understand what's going on, when, when you know, they stop for a second and pause or how long they spend at different parts of, of the, the system. And it's something we're gonna implement to, to make it simple where we could actually do 
um, end user testing on hundreds and hundreds of people and not actually have to basically bog down real people watching these videos because today we actually record the videos and watch people going through these steps to understand what make, what's wrong with the product because you can't just put a system in place and think you know everything. Once you put it in the hands of your end users, they're gonna find problems with it. You need to create evidence-based software. Just like we, you know, you would never uh, prescribe medicine that's never been tested that doesn't have any, uh, any evidence behind it. So at that point, you can get to a minimum viable product. You don't have to, again, boil the ocean. You don't have to do everything. You find out the, the function you want to achieve. You figure out how you want to implement it, what systems you want to put it on, and then put it out in a way that it works smoothly and it does what it's supposed to do. This is actually everything up to this point. It's all the design that goes into it that then becomes a good product. It's not just about sticking a bunch of people in a room and having them code for six months or two months or, or two years. It's the design around it that truly matters. I'll give you some examples of some other things we've done. This is a, just a quick little data visualization, but the reason I'm showing this is because I can't actually show this other um, product, which again is a, uh, it's, a neural network based on Bayesian models that we built for a pharmaceutical company that basically does, helps them with uh, precision medicine. They're looking at um, proteinomics, gen genomics, lipidomics, and metabolomics um, in, a, in a Bayesian uh, network so that they can understand how all these different aspects interact with each other when they apply a specific chemical compound to a biological sample. So it, it reminds me of something I heard a while back. Um, I think it's Francis Crick. Uh, there's this rumor about him where he discovered uh, the double helix of, uh, of DNA while uh, on LSD. He imagined himself actually sitting there on the double helix. And in this case, we actually have set up a way where they can look at a 3D model of all the interactions of all the different bioinformatics data, all the proteins and lipids and how they interact in certain instances without having to be on drugs. This system is a clinical trial um, investigator portal and it's just a basic s software as a service. It's a website. And a website doesn't, just because it's feeding data, general data, it doesn't have to be an ugly, non-responsive website. It can be something that actually has a little bit more, I don't know, beauty to it. This is a, a simple patient portal, something that we actually built for uh, New York Presbyterian. Um, and we built it in two weeks, I think, two, three weeks, um, using multimedia, a variety of different ways. It was for a hackathon challenge for them. And again, it's, it's a little bit of time you put into things to get them to look and act differently than the way most of the software that we're using today is. Um, and by the way, it's integrated with Fire, but anyway. Um, this is a uh, gamified um, system that basically helps children understand their condition, whether it can be set up for a variety of different things, whether it's diabetes or um, a, another condition, and it goes through and basically educates the child in a, and applies gamification to get them more involved in their healthcare. Obviously, they're sitting with their, their parents while they do this, but again, it shows, you know, when you understand the person that you're actually building the system for, whether it's an elderly person, whether it's a child, you know, you can actually make appropriate changes to the software to, to really make the person feel like you developed it for them. So again, we are data art, we're about 2200 strong. And you know, I guess the, the end thing I wanna leave you with is I really think we can make a difference, but we have to actually push the market. We have to make it so that the, the patients are actually getting the benefit of all the different products and all the innovations that we're coming up with. Because 
from what I can see so far, it's just not as available. And if it's there, the doctor's not telling us. They're not pointing at us, pointing to us. They're not saying, hey, by the way, you can, you can uh, you know, call Teladoc and ask them about cancer, or there's this great um, depression app called Uplift, or you know, if you have lupus, there's Mimey. They're not telling us this. So what do we do? We have to push. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for cutting that a little short, too. That was fantastic. You got your message across. Dan, stay up here, because now we have the Killer Apps for Healthy Living panel. We actually did this uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it was fantastic. That was very design-focused. But now we've got great representatives from uh, entrepreneurship, from... Uh, from